video and welcome one and all to our time of worship. May the Lord be with us all as we share and worship together this morning. We do want to uh, remember those too who are sharing with us in other ways and we're glad that you're able to do so. Just a number of announcements as we usually have at this time. You're all aware we have our annual general meeting following the service. It's a potluck and you're all invited to attend, be a part of that. I would ask uh, that after the meeting, we just have a brief time perhaps with the boards of property, deacons, our Christian education, our church clerk, maybe a trustee or two for a very brief meeting. And anyone's welcome also to share in that time. The deacons have been discussing sort of going forward. Uh, so if we could just take a moment after the service and a few of you stay behind, that would be helpful. Thank you. Tonight as well is our club's B and B minus, so that means we've changed our day from Friday to Sunday nights. And that's at 6.30 p.m., our club's B and B minus, our youth group. So remember our leaders and young people, please, in prayer. There's a bit of a shift, uh, and we'll see how that works. And then on the coming Wednesday, the 31st, at 7 p.m., our deacons meet. And then, of course, at the end of the coming week, Saturday at 7, 8 a.m., 7 a.m., I think it's 6.30 even possibly, some come to, to get a really wonderful breakfast going for the, those who come. So please uh, join with us, and if you are planning to come, let Tim Casinas know uh, so they can plan accordingly. But that's the men's breakfast at 8 a.m. this coming Saturday. Don't know if there's any other me announcements at this time. No? Okay. Well, let us come before God in a time of prayer. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Our God is an awesome God. God reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Let us worship God as we are led in song. Our God is an awesome God, and we are going to sing through, we're going to sing through two short ones this morning, and we're going to sing them both through twice. So, awesome God is the first one, and then it'll, this slide will switch, and we're going to sing it through twice as well. All right? You'll stand and join me.
Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, we are grateful for this opportunity to join with others in singing your praises, to confess our sins and receive your forgiveness, to hear your word, to seek your will for our lives. May your Holy Spirit move among us as we rededicate our lives to your service, leading and guiding us even as we join in praying as our Lord Jesus Christ has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. first of our readings from the Bible at this time is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 15 through 20. 
where we read, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. <clears throat> you must listen to him, for this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire any more, or we will die. The Lord said to me, What they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to death. And then let us share in reading responsively Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his purposes are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. God's holy ways are just and true. Number 663 if you will stand and join me.
Let us pray. We do come singing your praises today, O God, and we do thank you for your many good gifts to us. We thank you especially for your presence with us at this time and for each one here, for the opportunity that you do give us week by week to share in these ways, to seek your will for our lives, and to come before you with thanksgiving for all things. And as your people call to love one another, we pray for the needs of the church today, O oh God, our own church in particular, and for the whole human family, all the world. We pray for the churches the world over, of all the many different traditions, that we may discover our unity in Christ and exercise our gifts in the service of all. Praying also that the earth may be freed from war and famine and disease, and the air, soil, and waters be cleansed of poison. Oh God, thank you for the gift of this earth, this beautiful world in which you have placed us. Praying as well that those who govern and maintain the affairs of our world, peace in particular, may exercise their powers in obedience to your commands as we have just sung. And praying to you, O oh God, that you will strengthen our own nation of Canada to pursue just priorities so that races may be reconciled, the young educated and the old cared for, the hungry filled and the homeless housed, and the sick comforted and healed. O oh God, we Remember those of our own number who are in need of comfort and healing and pray for them at this time. And, O oh God, hear our prayer that you will preserve all who live and work in our area of St. Thomas and Aylmer and Tilsonburg in safety. We thank you for these winter months and for the snow that does fall. And for all the gifts that come to you from above. Yet we pray for safety. And that you will comfort and empower those who face any difficulty or trial. Again, the sick, especially those of our number who are shut in, who are dealing with difficult situations and diseases. We pray for them today. And we pray for the disabled the lonely, the oppressed. We pray for those who grieve and those who are in prison. And, O oh God, we do pray for ourselves. We thank you for the gift of this life, for each day that you do give to us. And for how, as a merciful God, as a potter who fashions a vessel from humble clay, you are making each and every single one of us into new creations. And so we pray that you would shape us day by day through the cross of Christ your Son until we pray as continually as we breathe and all our acts, our prayer, through Jesus Christ and in the mystery of the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. As we come before God with our tithes and offerings, let us remember the words of Micah 6. What does the Lord require of us? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. And so we bring our money, gifts, and whole lives as an offering to God as the ushers come forward at this time. Let us pray in the words of First Chronicles. Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. 
Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Amen.
The New Testament scripture this morning is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1, or sorry, verses 21 to 28. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching? With authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Thanks be to God for his own holy word.
We are in year B of the Revised Common Lectionary, in which the Gospel readings, as we are aware, are taken largely from the Gospel of Mark. And one of the striking things about the Gospel of Mark is the way it focuses almost entirely on the person and work of Christ, while rarely focusing on us. Something we could say holds true for a lot of the Bible. But something which holds true especially for the Gospel of Mark. In the Gospel of Mark it says barely a word on Christian ethics and only gives us a demand here and there. In the Gospel of Matthew, by way of contrast, we're given no less than five separate occasions, I guess we could call them, when Jesus sits down to explain things to the disciples, with the Gospel of Luke sharing a number of wonderful stories Jesus told them about how they should live. And so once again, even when calling attention to Jesus as a great teacher, the Gospel of Mark very rarely does so by way of telling us what he actually taught. So this makes things interesting, I think, because as a preacher, I have found that many a person does want to hear at least a word or two on what we are supposed to be doing as Christians. How perhaps we may right some wrongs, how we may head off in a new direction. And of course, there is always a place for good biblical teaching as an article I read just last week, a current article, insists, it bears the title, Preach Doctrine dot 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 always, with the author making the case persuasively. It was a publication by Yale Divinity School. Yet as we have said, these are the sorts of things we would be hard pressed to find here in the Gospel of Mark. In chapter one, for example, we read of how Jesus enters a synagogue in Capernaum on the Sabbath in order to teach. Yet nothing is said about the content of that teaching. And as this is the very first time we see Jesus as a teacher in the Gospel of Mark and he is right there in the number one teaching institution of the day, that's essentially what the synagogue was, a time for prayer, a reading of a scripture, and an exposition, that was it. We might expect to hear a word or two on what Jesus believes about the kingdom of God, which he has already come preaching, and perhaps where he's headed. Maybe a word on what he believes. While all we get is a description of the way the people responded. They, depends on your version, were astounded, says Mark. And kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority. So the focus of the gospel is on what the people thought about Jesus and his teaching. And not on other things we might deem to be important. Now this story of Jesus teaching people in the synagogue in Capernaum. And the way we also gather here on a weekly basis reminds me of my days in school. <clears throat> I was the sort of student who sat near the back of the class, but I was also the sort of student who took really good notes. So that helped me manage, and that's the sort of scenario I have in mind when it comes to what we're doing here today. I have this idea we may have come in here to hear a scriptural word or two, on what we could be doing in the week ahead and then having gotten our little assignments for the week head on out. 
So we may note that the only thing Jesus gave the people to go on that day in the synagogue was a sense of wonder or amazement, is the word Mark uses. And of course, we may also note how Jesus and his teaching stirred things up, so much so that just a little over a chapter later, the religious and political leaders of the day are already conspiring to get rid of him, to kill him, have him killed. Well, back here in Mark chapter 1 and our story, another conflict is brewing. As much then as Jesus is all about helping suffering people, we find here that he is also all about going head to head with the powers that be. And as he may very well have taught the people in the synagogue about God's holy ways being just and true, as we sang in our hymn, here in Mark chapter 1, we see that Jesus is also about waging war on those demonic powers that contests God's holy ways and power. So it is one thing for him to teach with the authority of a person who has his theology cased, if we may put it that way, or as a truly wise person with wisdom to offer, while it is another thing for Jesus to speak with divine authority to those spirits who try to act like gods among us. You will note that the man with the unclean spirit cries out, addressing Jesus not only as Jesus of Nazareth, something we already know, but also as the Holy One of God. And perhaps this is the crux of the matter. Time and again, the Gospel of Mark calls Jesus a teacher, but he is not just any teacher. He is the Holy One of God. So he is God among us. And of course, his message is part and parcel of who he is. So whether Jesus said a few words on the kingdom of God that day in the synagogue or not, we may assume that he said something other than just some interesting thoughts about God. Whoever wishes to understand Jesus and what he said must look at Jesus, the healer, the teacher, himself. And as he had taken his place right then and there in their midst, and sort of carved out a place for himself. And we are told that those who encountered him were astounded. In amazement, they kept on asking one another, what is this? You'll find that question come up in a number of ways in Mark. I want to be careful here. Our relationship to Jesus Christ is a bit of a journey of faith and adventure, and we will be looking at that later in the year. And in the course of that journey, that adventure, we may ask many a question. And people do have all sorts of ideas and thoughts about Jesus. So the many high theological claims a book like the Gospel of Mark makes about Jesus can lead to a, a fair bit of wondering. Messiah, Son of God, Son of Man, Lord Son of David, suffering servant, suffering just one, the Holy One of God. Such theological claims can lead to a fair bit of prayerful wondering as they invite us to move beyond seeing Jesus in terms of a great moral or ethical teacher. As they invite us to move beyond seeing Jesus as an example of the highest and the best of humanity. At the heart of the Christian faith, after all, lies the sort of amazement we find here in the Gospel of Mark chapter 1, as well as the rest of the Gospel. Thus, the Gospel of Mark invites us to see in Jesus much more than a great teacher, the Son of the living God. In other words, as much of God as we ever hope to see. On the evening of May 24, 1738, a weary Anglican priest and scholar by the name of John Wesley went very unwillingly, as he recorded in his journal, to a meeting in Aldersgate Street in London, England, 
And again, as Wesley records in his journal, as one was reading from Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans, I felt my heart strangely warmed and that Christ had taken away my sins, even mine. Here was Wesley, newly returned to England from an exhausting tour as an itinerant missionary to America, where he had pretty much knocked himself out preaching faith and doing good works, writing about an experience that had moved him to his very core, igniting what came to be known as the Wesleyan revival, which swept England. The source of which was Wesley's amazement at God's grace being for him. Just one little and particular and, I grant you, individual example of what we are talking about today, but also a good example of what can lie at the very heart or center of the worship of the, the church and of the Christian life. For what we are in large part about here on Sunday mornings is an encounter with Jesus Christ. And the sort of amazement produced by that encounter, that grows out of that encounter with this Jew from Nazareth who was God in the flesh. Way back in seminary, our professor of Christian ministry one day posed a question about the purpose of preaching. And with our heads chock full of thoughts and ideas on the transcendence and imminence of God, the atonement. See, this is like that day in the synagogue, sort of. <laughs> the atonement, predestination. And our hearts, I would say, full of the desire to grow spiritually and to develop our pastoral skills, we had quite the discussion eventually concluding that the purpose of preaching is not just three good biblical points in a poem that people can take home. The purpose of preaching is to bring people to Jesus Christ, or at least to do our best to encourage people in their encounters with Jesus Christ, as well as to be amazed that he hasn't given up on us yet. And to this day, I like to think that we just about got it right. In the church, there is always a place for sound biblical teaching and ethical instruction. But surely one of the reasons you come here is to share in an experience of Jesus Christ and to be amazed. And the good news is that Jesus is completely and utterly amazing. So let us continue to invite him to move in among us and to fill us with astonishment and to demonstrate to us that he is a living God. Let us pray. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you for the ways in which you do come and move among us. And how whenever we get together with you, unexpected things can happen. And we thank you for how not even our carefully printed orders of service, our bolted down pews, our love of the predictable and pleasant can control the ways you work. So help us to continue to be open to how you may be reaching out to us to reveal that you are a living God. And help us to be open and responsive to your saving work in our hearts and lives. In your name, amen. As we end our service this morning, a familiar song, Amazing Grace, number 422. If you will stand and join me. <clears throat>
May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you is faithful and will do this. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen.